Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door and let's chat about art, architecture, history, real estate, and more. Let's jump in. Repositories of books, either for loan or for sale, have always been a place of quiet congregation. Libraries and bookshops have provided the context for contemplation, exploration, and even meditation for centuries of literate human society. What draws us in? Is it the window displays of new titles or the many untold treasures that lie waiting inside? Even with the unlimited access to information online these days, and next day door delivery of the printed word, these brick and mortar bastions of knowledge and storytelling stand firm, offering up new horizons to the reader. It is not without struggle, however. Libraries continue to have to prove their worth, and bookshops their relevance, in order to keep their doors open. So why are we still attracted to the hands-on experience of searching out the next good read? How have libraries and bookstores added to the human experience over the ages? Tune in as we explore these questions with our guest, award-winning author Elise Friedman, and attempt to uncover the mysterious appeal of the book lover's sanctuary. Many of us can probably remember how we felt when we first received our first library card. For most, it was likely our very first piece of identification and the very first membership we could claim. There was likely no picture on it, but that little card offered boring privileges and the associated responsibility of caring for the books and promised to return them. It was a small step towards the responsibility that adulthood would soon demand. It made us feel grown up. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember my first library card. I remember how exciting it was to borrow books. I'm not quite sure if it was the books themselves that I was so excited about or the fact that I didn't really need my parents to check them out for me, maybe a little of both. Yeah, I just felt really grown up having an actual real mm -hmm. plastic card that I could put in my very cool Snoopy wallet. But now, of course, my library card is virtual. True. It's online now, isn't it? Boring books always came with that panicky feeling when I couldn't find all my books that were due to be returned. I found the threat of a potential late find very stressful. It actually caused me a lot of stress over the years, even through grad school. You might be surprised to learn this, but I was a pretty disorganized book borrower. That actually does really surprise <laughs> me, Walker. <laughs> Today, that stress has been redirected to the odd unpaid parking ticket that can be <laughs> found at the very dark bottom of my purse. <laughs> yeah, those parking <laughs> tickets seem to have legs. They're always disappearing. So do you still borrow books from the library or do you try and avoid that stress now? I do borrow books from libraries, but the books that I tend to want happen to be books that are already on hold for other people. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say I'm more of a book buyer now. Do you know, I actually had a professor in university who claims to have never had a fine from an, having an overdue library book. How is that even possible? I mean, I never had many fines, mm -hmm. but I'm sure I had one or two. Well, I'm not quite sure how he did it, because if you knew him, you'd know he was a wildly absent-minded person. But I guess when it came to his library books, they were always in order. Well, I guess that's something to be proud of, a, a <laughs> positive legacy there. But I wouldn't feel very bad if I were you, though. The most overdue library book known was 288 years late. Wow. Okay. That makes me feel <laughs> so much better. I can remember one time I misplaced a library book for quite some time. I just couldn't find it. And when I did find it, I took it back to the library and found out that what I owed actually was an amount that was higher than the value of the book to replace it. So that ancient book, was it ever returned? It actually was. The Guinness Book of World Records says that this book was returned to Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. Hmm. It was borrowed in 1668. And as I said, it was returned just under 300 years later. And just for context, 1668 was the year that Sir Isaac Newton, 
built the world's first reflecting telescope, and also when one of the world's oldest central banks was established in Stockholm, Sweden. So this was a really long time ago. Yeah, so you've got me here. I have to ask, what was the book about? It must have been something pretty special to hang on to it for all, you know, almost three centuries. Uh, You would think so, (laughs) but the translated title of the book was Various Historians of the Northern Germans and of Neighboring Peoples. It was borrowed by Colonel Robert Walpole, who was the father of Sir Robert Walpole, who is regarded as the first Prime Minister of Great Britain. And Colonel Walpole borrowed it when he was an undergrad student, just like you were saying. Mm. A writer who was writing Colonel Walpole's biography found this book while he was conducting his research. Well, that's a nice of him to return it, I suppose. I wonder why he didn't just hang on to it. Yeah, I did actually discover why he returned it. The descendants of Colonel Walpole preferred him to return it to the library in Cambridge. Oh, I see. Well, did you know that I read that the Guinness Book of World Records in the Bible are the books that go missing the most from libraries? The Guinness Book of World Records, I can totally understand because that was a go-to book for me mm-hmm. when I was young, but I, but the Bible? Yeah, I know, right? I would have thought that the Bible would have been a book that would be easily accessible to enough people that it wouldn't warrant stealing. And anyway, what about the part thou shall not steal? Right? That doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Very good point, Walker. Well, both of us have spent so many years in school. I think it's pretty safe to say that you, like me, probably feel like libraries are your second home. Yeah, I do. And this is probably why I feel so comfortable in bookstores as well. Absolutely. I love book browsing in either libraries or bookstores. And, you know, we often say about ourselves that we're sort of lifelong learners. So I'm in heaven when surrounded by books, whether it's in a library, a bookstore, big, small, new, used... It's just a feeling of unlimited freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel the same way. It could be, though, that, you know, the archaeologist in me somehow finds books very mysterious. Uh, You know, all those words and all those pages and they're tucked between two covers and then they're sort of up there on the shelves, all Mm -hmm. hidden away. The big bookshops these days, though, they're obviously great for all the variety of products that they offer and also experiences. You can just plop down on a nice comfy armchair and get your coffee from the coffee shop that's in there and just be pleasantly distracted by people watching. There's there's a lot more there than just books. You can even buy a bathrobe at my local big bookstore. To sit in the chair and read your book? I'm sure you probably could, and I'm sure it's been done, though uh, it's not something I would be really into. Still, it's the smaller independent bookstore that still has my heart. The soul of the owners on display in their windows, showcasing all their new favorites, and it's just a much more intimate experience. It's almost romantic when browsing in a small bookshop. It's really, truly one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, and of course, when you purchase a book from a small independent, you're supporting a small business owner and their families too. Now, we have a gorgeous little children's bookstore in our neighborhood, Mabel's Fables. Oh, right. It's one of my favorite memories, um, taking my children when they were growing up to Mabel's Fables. It's so colorful and cozy and inviting. And it was like walking into this magical storybook cottage. Mm -hmm. And upstairs, uh, there was story time that was offered to children in these oversized chairs and stuffed animals, huge stuffed animals everywhere. There's even a store cat who, of course, was named Mabel. That is amazing. I'm not sure if I... Oh, I do remember the store cat. I think every store should have a store cat. I think so. I love that shop, Mabel's Fables. I actually took a children's fiction course there a million years ago, but it really truly is a fixture in the neighborhood and much, much loved by everyone, all the residents. The bookshop has been a mainstay of most high streets and a cornerstone of community. Mm -hmm. I read in my research that the English writer, Sir Philip Pullman, who's the author of The Golden Compass, which is an excellent read, by the way, Uh, described independent bookshops as the lantern bearers of civilization. 
Well, that is a pretty powerful statement. That's true, though. When I was growing up, libraries were the only source when you needed information. Libraries and, you know, a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas in the basement. Oh, my gosh. The Encyclopedia Britannica. (laughs) They were so handy. I think it was the only source listed on all of my early school projects, right? I know. And a good source it was. It was. Yeah. (laughs) Research beyond the basement always required a trip to the library, though, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah. Every time I look up facts on my phone, which I do constantly, driving my family crazy, I always think of the effort I would have had to go through to discover that same information when I was growing up. Oh, I know. It's just at our fingertips now. Do you remember the dreaded microfiche? Uh, How can I forget? For some reason, the microfiche freaked me out. (laughs) Like if you had to do class trips to the library to research a project and it came up that one of your sources was on the microfiche, I would panic and like choose another topic. I could not deal. Oh, I still am not 100% sure how to move it around up and down. And yeah, because I think you had to do it the opposite way that you wanted to go. I there think. was something super <laughs> freaky about the microfiche. I'm not sure if it, maybe it was the technology that freaked me out because computers at that time were not household staples, right? No. So, yeah, totally freaked me out. My kids wouldn't even know what a microfiche was at this point. <laughs> I don't even think they'd be able to use, they would be able to use the Dewey Decimal System. They wouldn't wouldn't even know what that was. But I guess they don't really have to because everything is online these days. Periodicals, scientific papers, theses, newspapers. I mean, you can find pretty much anything online. And even libraries have extensive content online. But I say online Schmonline. Ooh, pushback. Yeah. I know. Those are strong <laughs> words, and this is going to be my platform for my opinion. You're sticking to it. I am. Even though today we can access what seems like an unlimited amount of information online, libraries and bookstores still maintain an important place in our society. It hasn't been easy, though, on booksellers. Big box stores have pushed out many of the smaller independently owned stores and home delivery and ebooks have posed serious challenges for, for our bricks and mortar booksellers. I still have a really major soft spot for these places, as I've mentioned. And I'm admittedly not an e reader. Mm. I like to pick up the book, open it up, read the back flap, read the inside flap, you know? Oh, absolutely. I'm right with you on that one. And, you know, they say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but I have to say, that I love those book covers that are soft and velvety. Me too. <laughs> I actually grab them off the shelf. And yeah. <laughs> it's terrible, but I'm obsessed with them. I know. I don't even care what's inside. I'll just buy it for that. And those rough edged paper, oh, yeah, you know, for the sure. edges of the, I love it. So clearly we're the target market for the, I, I know for the, we are. the in living color bookshop. <laughs> I was really surprised to read recently that book sales have made a comeback, according to the Association of American Publishers. Maybe that's because of the pandemic. It really promoted some uh, downtime where people could return to reading. And I'm hoping that this is good news for the independent bookseller, too. I also read a survey that reported that people still preferred the printed book rather than the electronic or audio version. So I'm not alone. And this was according to data from Statista's Advertising and Media Outlook. Well, that's reassuring. That makes me feel so much better because I actually worry about the future of libraries. I understand that. And I think that's a legitimate concern. Libraries reach people who don't have ready access to computers or funds to purchase books, as well as those who do. And there are also community hubs where people gather to study or work, research, read, or even just to chill out. Possibly the greatest service offered by public libraries is the fact that they provide a place of refuge for people, Mm -hmm. a place for people to be with other people, but in a quiet and reflective environment. Yeah, they are a place of sanctuary for many people. They're a great place to wander and browse for people who have time to kill during the day or even a quiet place to take a nap. I certainly have taken my share of naps in the stacks while studying for exams over the years. Almost too many. Oh <laughs> Almost my gosh. too many to say. Yeah, me too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I spent my summers in my undergrad as a research assistant okay. at uh, the University of Toronto, and it was bliss. All, I was pretty much in libraries 
all the time collecting research. But when the summer heat got to be too much or I had a few too many margaritas the (laughs) night before, I would take my lunch hour and go and have a nice, cool, refreshing nap in the stacks of Robart's library. Well, we've both spent a lot of time in libraries. I used to be a library assistant in high school. (laughs) Oh, well, that is a claim to fame. Exactly. Napping really isn't an option in most bookshops, though, but they too serve as a place for people to meet and connect. Yeah, I would think that the addition of coffee shops and comfy comfy chairs would promote extended stays and that they've made bookshops even more popular with a single crowd. Like, just think. Think of the bookstore scene when when Harry met Sally, when Carrie Fisher says to Meg Ryan, someone's staring at you in personal growth. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they can be romantic spots, They really can. Or at least the place where the spark starts. Yeah, absolutely. I read about one American couple, actually, who met at a Detroit bookstore in 2016 and got married in the store in 2017. Isn't that cute? Very I bet they were really avid readers. Yes, I would think that would be a safe bet. You know, we clearly love libraries and bookstores, you and I, but not everyone, I imagine, is a reader. And some people much prefer to spend their time moving rather than sitting and getting lost in a book. For some people, I would think libraries may bring back some negative childhood memories, Mm -hmm. you know, when they're reminded of a time where they had to sit still and they had to be quiet. And maybe some people actually find them kind of boring. Yeah, or maybe there's academic trauma, you know, trying to meet deadlines with projects (laughs) and PhD theses. No trauma here. (laughs) Yikes. I hadn't really ever thought about it, I guess, but I think that is very possible that some people aren't big lovers of libraries and bookstores. It's kind of hard for me to imagine, though, because all of my family are readers. In fact, I remember this time when I recognized that my husband's and my reading had passed down to our children. We were poolside at a water park, believe it or not, and we were reading and I looked up from my book and all three of my kids, they were younger at the time, had their noses buried deep in a book. No, just let me say here, I have to point out that that's every mother's dream. (laughs) No, right? And especially in a water park. But it was a beautiful thing, not only because you want your children to to have a love of reading, but also I could just sit and be quiet with my own book. But I would think that even if you weren't a reader, a lot of the bigger bookshops do offer something. Like, for example, my best friend, she's not a big reader. Her Kids aren't big readers, but she still values a trip to the big box bookstore because they offer so much more now in terms of housewares and gifts and all that sort of stuff, like even bathrooms, like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So perhaps libraries and bookstores have shaped all of our lives, whether we're readers or non-readers. We're so fortunate today because we have the opportunity to explore this further with Elise Friedman, a critically acclaimed author poet, screenwriter, and playwright based in Toronto, Canada. Her most recent book, entitled The Opportunist, will be on shelves as of November 29th. Welcome, Elise. Thank you for joining us today. So, Elise, I've always believed that great authors must also have also been avid readers themselves. When you enter a bookshop, what's your strategy or plan? Is there a certain section you gravitate to first, or is there a section that you avoid? Hmm. I mean, it probably depends on the store. So if I'm going into like a beautiful, small indie, like type books or, or queen books or flying books, I will go right away to the tables, the curated shelves and the curated tables. Cause I know that the owners of those stores are really uh, like I trust their judgment to to show me what's new and interesting and they'll have staff select. So I'll go straight for that. Okay. If I go into um, a, a store like The Strand, which is incredible. I don't know if you've ever been there. Uh, it's in New York. It's they They call it 18 miles of books. It's just massive. There's millions of books. Read about it. Yeah, it's incredible. Then I'll just wander like, you know, it's like going to an affair. Like you can just wander the aisles and see where they take you. There's no real plan. You meander and you find treasures. And then if I go into like a chain store like Indigo, I will go to the uh, bestseller wall, like the new um, stuff, just to see what's 
new. And then I will probably get sucked into the uh, beautiful notebook section and spend far too much money on gorgeous notebooks that uh, I don't even need. What and is it about notebooks? Start. Yeah, right? The notebooks I mean, serves. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have too many. I see beautiful blank notebooks, and but then I end up like writing notes on my phone. So there's no justification for it. So it just depends on the story, I guess. Okay, good to know. So do you have any favorite childhood memories of visits to bookshops or libraries? I they do. I do. I have a really strong and good memories of going to the library when I was little. So my my mom would take me sometimes and I remember her being pleasantly exasperated because we could only take out five at a time. Mm. And I would read them with like I would read them in three days and we'd have to go back. Um, so just having alone time with my mom to go to the library was great. But I have this really strong memory. So we grew up in North York and at the North York Public Library, there was um, an auditorium in the basement with a baby grand or a grand piano. And uh, my dad is musical. And we had like this really cruddy little upright piano in our place that was always perpetually out of tune. So we'd go and get books and then we'd sneak into the auditorium and I would read and my dad would play this beautiful piano. And uh, it was great. And my, if my brother was there, he'd like, or my sister were there, they'd run around in, in the uh, auditorium chairs and play and I would read and, and listen to and play. So it was really nice. Beautiful family memory. Yeah. Oh, and the, and the bookmobile. Do you guys remember the bookmobile? Yes. 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 One of my favorite memories is the bookmobile. I forgot about the bookmobile. Right? Oh. I love the bookmobile. Me too. And yeah. every week it would show up at the, we lived uh, on a street that had a little strip mall at the end and the bookmobile would park in the parking lot and it was so close and just going into the bookmobile was great. I have a good memory of that. Me Absolutely. too. Absolutely. And when you're a fast reader, I would, I kind of have similar childhood memories, especially about having to go to the library often because right. you would get your stack of five and then you'd zip yeah. through and you're normally reading a series and you have to get the next one, like whether it was Nancy Drew or whatever, but I'm not yeah. reading myself, but you know, do you think that you have to be an avid reader to enjoy libraries and bookshops? Or do you think there's another kind of draw or appeal? I mean, I think personally, I think there, there are books for everyone. Some people don't want to read fiction, but I guarantee you that in a bookstore like The Strand or in any library, there is a book for everyone, yeah. whether it's a biography or a how-to or, uh, you know, a science book. Like there's, 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 you don't have to be like an avid fiction reader to appreciate uh, these spaces. No, I think they're for everybody. Yeah, I think you're right. And sometimes I guess from my perspective, because I am a fiction lover and a nonfiction lover, mm -hmm. that's sort of where my viewpoint is. But you're right. There is a book for absolutely everybody. So how would you say that books and bookshops have influenced your career as, as an author? I mean, in many different ways. I mean, books, of course, have had a profound influence on my life. They've been so deeply important to me ever since I was a kid. Like I connected more with the people in, in books than I did with the people who were around me. I really did. And maybe kind of still do sometimes. <laughs> um, so they were hugely important when I was like a messed up teen. Like I'm convinced that characters and books really saved my life actually yeah and then for inspiration like just for a love of words when you're reading good writing it's just so inspiring it really and, truly is yeah and in terms of bookstores I mean I would you know when I was a teenager and I would be kind of like lurking around um readings you know because bookstores have events right it's not just shelves full of books mm -hmm. I would you know kind of sneak into these readings and stand at the back and be very nervous and see authors read from their books so it was also you know exciting in that way and communal and and yeah I, I think uh, they've had a huge influence on me 
-hmm. Yeah. And with readings too, it's, it's like a full experience. You know, you're seeing where those characters that you so deeply connect with, where their origin story is in, in the author. So that's a full, a whole other side to reading. Do you have any examples of books that have, that really stand out to you in your, either in your childhood or your youth or even, even oh, now? Yeah. yeah. I mean, in my youth, like the Anne of Green Gable books were very important to me. Yeah. And, you know, my father is a, a Holocaust survivor. And so I read the diary of Anne Frank and being a Canadian kid and also the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, I've always felt that I was kind of torn between these two Anne's or sort of part of both of those ands. So those ands were huge in my childhood. That was, those were important books for me. Wow. Um, and then when I was a teenager, uh, discovering poetry was really important to me. I, I know he's <laughs> controversial, but Charles Bukowski was uh, just his straightforward, honest poetry was very uh, great to, to discover as a teenager. And J.D. Salinger was hugely important to me as a teenager. I loved his oddball outsider characters, and they made me feel like I wasn't alone in the universe. Like, they were very, very important. Absolutely. And, I, yeah, because when we are teens, we don't know yet that there is such a vast spectrum of personality and people we think we have to conform to whatever we're seeing in our high schools. And, you know, perhaps when we were in high school, it was even that much more delineated by what you wore and what music you listened to and that kind of thing than even it is today. So mm -hmm. yeah, seeing those characters represented in literature, certainly I, I resonate with that. I, that had the same, a similar impact on me. Yeah. Yeah. I think one, one huge value to literature is that it tells people it reaches out into the uh, the reader's mind and heart and just says or, or can say you're not alone mm -hmm. because you can feel isolated or you know like you say in high school not connecting with the groups around you and you can find a confederate in a book like somebody who you relate to and it's very you know it can be very important now yeah. that I'm older like I I read very widely and there's not one book that's a standout. I just love so many books, but uh, coming up as a kid, they were, there were certain books that were really, really crucial. Yeah. Life-changing. Yeah. And you said too, something really interesting. I think that you can find, you can almost find community in, in the book that you're reading. And I think that perhaps in the pandemic, people look to reading even more maybe than they did before, had more time to, and were able to find community when they were perhaps more, more isolated. Yeah, I think that's true. I think books, uh, there were a lot, books did well in the pandemic because people were stuck at home and because they had time. I mean, so many people love to read, but you know what it's like. We have like crazy busy lives and it's hard to find uh, time. So yeah, I think that was a huge thing in the pandemic just to sink into a book. Absolutely. And I also think too, it's the lack of time, but it's also screens. Like yeah. I know for me personally, I've had to carve out time and really limit my screen, put away my phone or laptop mm -hmm. or whatever it is to go back to just the old practice of reading. You know, I'm not an e-reader or anything like that, but just to open that book and, you know, dig in and get comfy and, uh, but really have to mindfully put those screens away. Do you have that same sort of? I, I do. I mean, I, I love TV. I love narrative in any form. So it's really easy to get <laughs> sucked into uh, that world. I, I do not have any screens in my bedroom though. So I have, no, mm. I don't keep my phone in, in my bedroom at night and I don't have a television or a computer in my bedroom. So that's the reading space. I go into bed and I read every day in bed. But in the evening, like there are uh, a lot of times when I'm watching uh, Netflix or something and I could be reading, but could be reading you know. instead. Although there are some very interesting things on Netflix these days, right? And all streaming services. There's all, mm -hmm. there's always something new to, to dig into there. Sure. So why don't you tell us about your new novel? 
Okay. It's called The Opportunist, and it's a literary thriller, which you can read in two different ways. You can read it as a straight ahead thriller. It's a page turner, lots of plot twists and turns and, and it's fun. It was very fun to write. Or uh, you can also read it on another level because it's very much about who holds power in the world and how that power can be abused. So on a plot level though, it's about a family, a very wealthy family and the patriarch is 76 years old and he starts dating his 28-year-old nurse. Hmm. And his sons, who are in line for the fortune of the family, are not happy about this because they view her as a gold digger and a threat to their inheritance. Right. So they want to get rid of her, and they need the help of their sister, who is estranged from the family because they have launched this plan. And they kind of suck her into their plan to try and lure the gold digger away from their father however the young woman uh, proves a lot more wily than they expected okay. and things get interesting very quickly oh i can't wait i love thrillers i love all of your books actually oh, i've been an you. avid fan for a long time and actually my daughter is too and she will be thrilled to hear it's a thriller because that's really her her cup of tea so she'll be very excited about it when is the book being launched? The book comes out in Canada on November 29th and in the U.S. on December 6th. Okay. And I'm having a book launch at Type oh. Books on Queen okay. Street. Yep. On the 29th at 7 p.m. at Type Books and everyone is welcome. Oh, that's amazing. Well, we hope to certainly be there and we will be celebrating your book. I can't wait to crack the cover of it. Uh, and it's a perfect time to actually purchase it for the upcoming holidays. That's true. And it's available now if you want to order it online. Okay. So we're going to make that uh, link available in the show notes for cool. everybody who's interested. I'm sure they will be. Uh, thank you very much, Elise, thank for, you very much. for taking the time to chat with us today and have those insights about the experiences you've had with libraries, bookshops, and those very inspirational and and sometimes life-changing books that you've encountered in your life. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Elise, for taking the time to chat today. We look forward to reading your new book, which will be released November 29th. Just as libraries and bookstores have played a key role in shaping our lives, art mimics reality and the way that bookstores in particular are presented in film. Yeah. Do you remember the rom-com You've Got Mail Harris? Yeah. Starring Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks, in that 1998 film, the David and Goliath story played out as the little independent children's bookstore struggles to stay alive in the shadow of a giant corporate bookseller, Fox Books. Spoiler alert here, it ultimately ends in a love story between the two shop owners. See, romance again. I'm not a big romantic comedy fan, but I do remember this movie pretty well. Right. I'm starting to think that this could have easily been a Valentine's Day episode in I some know. respects. I know. A lot of romance. <laughs> Here, Here's another romantic example for you. In Serendipity, a film released in 2001 featuring John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale, fate and books are intertwined as the female protagonist writes her phone number in a book and leaves it at a used bookstore in New York City. She's relying on destiny to allow the book to find its way back into the male lead's hand. Only then would she know if they were fated to be together. Now, I bet you can guess how it all turned out. I certainly can because it's how all romantic comedies <laughs> turn out, but I won't, uh, I won't give it away here. I think I must put serendipity on my must-watch list, though. I'm not much of a romantic myself, but I do appreciate the romance of a bookshop setting. And clearly, bookstores, like libraries, are an intrinsic part of our history. Film's done a great job of mirroring how so many of us feel about them, and definitely some novels have done that too. I recently read The Midnight Library with my alumni book club. Have you read that book? I have not read that book. It was written by Matt Haig. It's definitely a little different. It's a fictional novel that's set in an otherworldly library. So, which is overseen by a very wise librarian in this parallel universe. Mm -hmm. This library is a refuge of sorts, but it's also a wellspring of options for a future life path for the protagonist. It's it's definitely a different take on a library, mm -hmm. but it's it's a worthy read. 
Well, I have not read it. It definitely will be on my to-read list. You know, I've never had the opportunity to visit otherworldly libraries. Mm. I visited a lot of libraries, many big and small. Others are very grandiose and, you know, the cute little humble ones Mm -hmm. I like as well. Yeah, they all seem to have their own unique appeal, don't they? One library always stands out in my mind, and this is the ancient and much celebrated Great Library of Alexandria in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's always captured my interest. Apparently, it was one of the largest and most significant institutions of the ancient world, which is something you probably are quite familiar with. It is estimated that it housed 40,000 to 400,000 papyrus scrolls. And just imagining what knowledge was imparted on these documents makes me crazy that it's now all lost to time the mystery yeah some think it's now all resting on the bottom of the mediterranean sea the oldest continually operating existing library though is not too far away it's in fez morocco and it's the al karyawian library it opened in 1359 it is the home of a ninth century quran and a 10th century account of the Prophet Muhammad. There are also roughly 4,000 other rare books there. And until lately, only researchers had access to this most amazing place. But apparently now, it's going to be open to the public. Hmm, Well, that would be quite a trip. It would certainly be quite a trip. I would love to go there. I've never been to Morocco, but it's up there on my my bucket list. Hmm. The oldest existing bookshop in the world is the Livraria Bertrand. And this is a bookstore that was founded in 1732 in Lisbon, Portugal. And this is, again, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. But a close second is in London, England, on Piccadilly. It's Hatchards. And apparently Hatchards is favored by the royal family. Hmm. I'm actually a little bit disappointed that I haven't sought these shops out on my travels to the UK or Portugal because I imagine they're pretty fascinating and have a pretty cool vibe. I always like to think about, you know, who's walked between those walls and in that front door over the the centuries. Oh, that's exactly what I would be thinking as well. I imagine for a lot of people, it'd be like entering a house of worship. Yeah, I would think so. I was also curious when researching this episode, which city one could find the most bookstores in? And the answer really surprised me. Okay, where is it? It's in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Ah. It's been called the bookshop capital of the world and has more bookstores per capita than any other city. In fact, in 2015, The Guardian noted that there were 25 bookstores for every 100,000 people there. That's my kind of city. Yes, British author Neil Gaiman once said that a town isn't a town without a bookstore, and I suspect he might have been quite impressed with Buenos Aires based on the number of bookstores alone. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, there are just so many cool bookshops and libraries around the world. Have you been to any that stood out in your mind? I've been to a few that I've really loved, but there are so many more on my to-see list. Mm. It was really kind of hard to narrow them down for this episode. Two of the most atmospheric bookshops, I think, are in the Mediterranean. Okay. One is the Librari Aqua Alta in Venice, Italy, and the other is Atlantis books on Mm. the Greek island of Santorini. I haven't been to the Venetian shop, but I have been to Atlantis books. And we actually sought it out because we were traveling through the Cyclades and had run out of books, Mm. our family of five. And also it's a fabled destination among uh, both travelers and book lovers. So you walk into the shop and it's wall to wall, wall to wall books. Your eyes taken up, down, sideways, back, forth. Mm. They have collectibles, they have rare books, they have pretty much everything. And what was really important to us was that they had English books. So we walked out with a stack that day, all marked on the inside jacket with the bookstore stamp. And of course, the name of the shop is a nod to the legendary drowned city of Atlantis, which some believe to be modern day Santorini. The library... Aqua Alta is also on my hit list because some people call it the most beautiful bookstore in the world. 
It's known for keeping its books in bathtubs because of the regular flooding of that oh, well, that's, beautiful city. That's clever. It is. And the name of the bookstore itself means the bookstore of high water. Hmm. So makes sense. But of course, who could forget one of the most well-known bookshops and oldest bookshops, Shakespeare and Company in yep. Paris. The list of who's who who's hung out there is a very long, and it also cameos in one of your favorite films, I think, Walker. It does. Woody Allen's film, Midnight in Paris. But this store has a really cool history. It was first opened by an American woman named Sylvia Beach in 1919. It was a hangout for James Joyce, and in fact, Beach published Joyce's Ulysses, Ernest Hemingway, Ezra Pound, and many, many others. During World War II, Nazi occupation of Paris, the store closed because apparently Sylvia did not want to sell books to Nazis. One report states that she once refused to sell to a Nazi the last copy of Finnegan's Wake. The Nazi said he would return in the afternoon to take all of the books and close down her store if she didn't sell him that book. But she was a stubborn gal and in response to this threat, she moved all of the books upstairs to an apartment above the store, out of his reach. Unfortunately, as a result of her actions, Beach was sent to an internment camp for six months, and the store did not reopen. But she survived, and after her release, she reportedly offered the celebrated name of the bookshop to a bookseller named George Whitman. No relation to Walt, I don't think. So Shakespeare and Company opened their doors again in the 1950s, and the store continues to be run by Whitman's daughter, named Sylvia Beach Whitman, who George had named after the original bookstore owner. I a little love romantic, that. eh? I love that. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful story? It really is. Yeah. Well, definitely. When we think of libraries and bookstores, we often think about the space itself, you know, the building and the books that fill it. But we seldom talk about the sorts of things that get left behind in the books, whether accidentally or purposely. Oh, I'm interested to hear this. Yeah. Why do I always end up with this section? <laughs> the weird topics. Yeah. <laughs> Librarians find all manner of things in books returned to their care. And it probably wouldn't surprise you to hear that they regularly find you know, many things like bookmarks and concert tickets, lottery tickets, pressed flowers, even cash, but also postcards and letters that have been delivered and not delivered. Oh, wow. Well, the cash certainly would be a nice little welcome surprise. I know, right? Apparently, mm. though, the postcards and unsent letters are considered fun finds among library staff. You know, I think because they're personal, they tell a personal story that can sometimes be intriguing. Mm hmm Librarians often find weird and wonderful stuff too, though. Are you ready, Harris? I don't know if I actually <laughs> am. Okay, so some of the weird and wonderful things they found are condoms, gross. personal hygiene products, again, gross, positive pregnancy tests, many sharp things, including knives and tin can lids, um, divorce papers, mm -hmm. racy photographs, and I think. The scariest thing that I've read that have been reportedly found by librarians is a vile labeled smallpox sample. Oh, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing to find in the pages of your book. That's terrifying. I know. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think people intentionally leave these little gifties for the library staff to find? Oh, I have no idea about that. I think you'd have to speak with a librarian themselves. But Sharon McKellar, who's a librarian in Oakland, California, is looking, though. She keeps a collection of over 350 items that she's discovered, and she keeps a public web page so that the owners of the items have the opportunity to claim them as well she's found photos and grocery lists and receipts and all sorts of little things that they're they're tiny episodes themselves in the owner's lives beside um these sorts of things that we find in books or that librarians find we also inadvertently leave traces of our lives on the pages of a book <laughs> we aren't allowed food and drink at most libraries and for good reason but people often snack at home while they're reading. And it isn't surprising that food remnants from time to time end up between the pages of books that have been borrowed. Yeah, I always think that's kind of gross when I come across like a big smear of 
somebody's long ago lunch when I'm reading my library or used book. I know. It sort of stops you in your track when you're reading, right? But it's Mm -hmm. not just a splash that librarians report finding, though. Uh, They found Cheetos and Pop-Tarts and cheese slices, bacon strips cooked in both uncooked and also pickle slices. That's insane. It's almost like a whole sandwich. I know. I was just going to say, you got the bacon, you got the pickle, you got the cheese. I don't know about the Pop-Tart. But like, seriously, were they using these food items as bookmarks? I can't imagine that the books would have been in very good shape. Yeah. Well, bacon for sure. But I don't know if the strip of bacon was actually serving as a bookmark, but you can just imagine, right? Oh, absolutely. I wonder if bookstore staff have that same experience. Personally, I've never found anything in books that I've purchased from a bookstore. Have you? No, I haven't either. But apparently they do come across things from time to time. Perhaps it was more common in wartime because spies may have used books in libraries and bookshops to pass messages. Hmm. Did you know that the U.S. government sent librarians undercover to gather intelligence in World War II? I did not. Yeah, librarians could naturally make the rounds overseas in search of information without raising too much of a ruckus. And they did this, most notably, in neutral Lisbon. Hmm. Yeah, current Sherman newspapers were especially in demand. Well, that makes sense. But who knew that our librarians' work could be so dangerous? I've also heard of librarians who risk life and limb to save and care for their books in wartime. When I was researching this episode, I came across a group of rebel librarians, two words you don't hear commonly put Mm -hmm. together, who rescued books from the rubble of war-torn Syria. Even under threat of shelling and snipers, these librarians collected books and started a library in the town of Daraia. It quickly became a refuge for this community, a beacon of hope in a dark time. Wow, that's quite a story of heroism and community. Mm-hmm. It almost is the, uh, it would be a great plot for a movie. It would. Yeah. yeah. Books, bookshops, and libraries are cornerstones of culture, of connection, and the continuation of human story, really. I heard that even Ukrainian book publishers continue to publish despite the ravaging of their lands. And, you know, every time there's strife and war, so much of our global cultural heritage is lost. Yeah, it's really sad, actually. But it does underline the importance of the bookstore and the library, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. They are keepers of culture, the protectors of the published, critical to both local residents, but also to the world. And I, for one, I'm never going to underestimate my librarian or bookshop clerk, though I don't think I ever really have. I've always found them to be so helpful and knowledgeable and, of course, you know, usually very well read. Mm Mm-hmm. Libraries are an ancient institution whose origins stretch back to antiquity that not only house beloved books, but also safeguard cultural treatises, rare collectibles, and perhaps other less known tomes. Beyond this, libraries serve as gathering places where people can find sanctuary and the librarians are the keepers of that peace. Bookshops, though they have now morphed and expanded into more broad and diffuse shapes, still retain their magic, particularly in the small independent stores that pepper our planet. These institutions have played a role in the promotion and development of significant and stupendous literary talent, but they've also featured quite prominently in popular culture such as films and even novels themselves. So let's brandish a bevy and toast our purveyors of the written word. Our world would be much less magical without them. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your hosts, Harrison Walker. Follow us each week as we continue the conversation. 